Hey, good day, it's Preso. Thanks for joining me in the workshop today. Now this is episode 8 of building the Titan model aircraft engine. There's a playlist up above there now if you want to go back and check out the rest of the build. In today's episode we're going to finish off some details on the cylinder head of the engine and also the crankshaft end, but we'll talk about that in a minute. But because I love you all and I want you to be happy, I bought a new camera for the workshop. Now this is an Osmo action camera and I can use this for doing close-ups on the lathe and the milling machine and so on. And this is capable of doing 4K video. My other camera, which is filming this now, is a Sony Handycam, a fairly old one. It doesn't do anywhere near what this one can do. So I'm not sure how that's going to work out in my video editing software, but we'll give it a go. Anyway, let's have a closer look at what we're doing today. Okay, a couple of things we're going to do today. We're going to cut the fins in the cylinder head. Uh, that can be done on the milling machine just using a slitting saw. So we're just going to run a series of parallel grooves atop, across the top of the head. And we're going to drill and counterbore the six screw holes that go through the cylinder head. Now three of those screw holes go through into the cooling fin stack that is now shrunk onto the liner. And when we tighten up those three screws, that presses down against the top flange of the cylinder liner and keeps it clamped against the top of those cooling fins. Now there'll be another three screws that go all the way through from the top of the cylinder head right through the cooling fins and into the crankcase. So those three screws will stop any uh, twisting or any opportunity for this to move up and down inside the crankcase. So when all six screws are tightened up, there's no way that the liner can rotate or lift. So uh, some people are concerned that when the engine is running, the uh, differential expansion between these two metals might cause the liner to come loose. Even if that were to happen, it still can't move. So the designer, George uh, Ginevra, thought about all of that when he stipulated that we're gonna have six screws, but three in the cooling fin stack and three in the crankcase. Now we're also going to do some parts on the crankshaft today. We're going to replace this hex nut with a spinner made of an aluminium alloy. And that will uh, have a screw thread inside that clamps the propeller up against the propeller driver. Now that prop driver is pinned onto the crankshaft uh, and we'll have to cut a keyway in the prop driver to go over that pin. And that provides the positive drive from the crankshaft to the propeller. Now later on, if I can get the engine to run, I'm going to anodize the cylinder head and the spinner and that's just going to give the engine that nice uh, classy look. Now before we head over to the lathe, uh, I thought I'd address a lot of comments that were coming in about the, the finish that I put in this liner. Now there were ever so many people who said, why didn't you use a uh, brake cylinder home? Now it turns out I've actually got one. I bought it for doing another project uh, which was a steam engine cylinder and it worked great in that application. But there were two reasons why I wanted to try lapping on this liner. First one was I'd never done it before. <laughs> I just wanted to learn how to do it. And it seemed like a very scary process. Uh, everything I'd read seemed very technical. Turned out it wasn't like that at all. It was actually quite simple. And it produces uh, an absolutely first class finish inside that liner there. Uh, the second reason why I didn't want to use a brake cylinder hone is that they don't necessarily produce a truly circular bore. So if I, I was to squish this um, liner into an elliptical shape and then put the brake cylinder hone in it, it will actually rotate around that. And because the abrasive elements are spring loaded, they will just follow that elliptical bore. It won't correct it, it'll polish the inside, but it will still be elliptical. And they also don't necessarily correct any taper in the bore as well. So, uh, they were the reasons why I didn't bother using the brake cylinder home. So um, I hope that answers those questions. I, I did start answering the, the questions in the comments, but I found myself just repeating myself over and over, so I thought I'd address it here. Okay, um, let's go over the layers. I think we're going to do the prop driver first. Okay, I've got the new camera set up on my compound slide. I've never used one of these things, and it seems to be getting in the way, but We'll see how it goes, you just have to bear with me. Now this material is some free cutting mild steel. It's been lying around the floor for a couple of years, that's why it's all corroded. Um, but under that surface is something shiny.
All right, that outer diameter is fixed now, and we've got to try and bore the interior hole there at 7 sixteenths because I don't have a reamer of that size. These little small hole gauges are great for doing this sort of work, but they're still very subjective. You've got to have a feel for it. Looks like about 0 0.03 undersized. If necessary, I can uh, rework that later, but I don't want to go oversized. I've just gone back to my other camera because I want to review the footage that I took with the Osmo Action before I commit to doing a lot more of this build. Uh, at least I know this one gets a result. So uh, what I'm going to do now is break all these sharp edges and then we have to know the face of this raised section. This is the only straight nail that I've got and it's possibly a bit coarse for this but we'll see how we go. Well, <laughs> ah, that's interesting. I was sort of expecting a like a straight line across there, but it's more like a helical pattern and it's obviously half the pitch of the knurling wheel. But you know what? That actually looks pretty good. And it's really, really grippy. So uh, I'm happy with that. <laughs> happy accident. Gonna have to champ that edge again where the, the knurl has raised a burr. The drawing show this flat is supposed to be 130 thou. Oh, it's really hard to measure. That knurl changes the geometry of the part anyway, it would raise this front face here. It's supposed to finish at uh, 250 thou thick, a quarter of an inch. Uh, it's going to be more than that with that raised edge. Anyway, I give that a bit of a polish up and then we'll cut it off and that should be done.
blues the finished part and that pattern produced by that straight knurl is not what I was expecting but it's going to work out fine and the fit on the crankshaft is very good so it just slides on there and it should slide right up against the end of the crankcase casting in fact the bronze bush in the center there is the wearing surface and there's just minimal clearance there so um, I'm going to clean up the back face of that unfortunately the, um, the parting tool left a pretty ordinary finish there so I'll make a mandrel and I'll just polish that and then later on we'll parkerize this one part just give it that black finish anyway let's move on to the spinner this is the material we'll be using for the spinner this is 6011 aluminium alloy this will anodize really well when we're done it's oversized uh, what we're going to do is to face this off again once it goes in the chuck and then we're going to center drill and tap that 5 16 by 24 UNF. Now this will thread onto the end of the crankshaft and hold the propeller up against the prop driver. And the real challenge with this part is to be able to turn that semi-elliptical profile and make sure that when we take it off its threaded mandrel and put it back onto the crankshaft that it still runs absolutely concentric with the crankshaft. It's going to look stupid if this thing's got a wobble in it and anything with a threaded connection it's, it's always going to be a challenge to make sure that it can be interchangeable with two parts um, so we'll, I think what I'll do is rough it out and then we'll try it on the crankshaft and see how concentric it is now if that's a failure there's no point in going any further ideally what you would do is machine this part on the crankshaft but for various reasons I can't do that which we'll look at later but anyway let's give it a go this is the stock that we're using for the spinner and this back surface will be threaded to go onto the end of the crankshaft. So I'll get all that prepped and then I'm going to put it on a mandrel to do some tricky machining for the profile of the spinner. And it turns out this Osmo Action Camera, uh, the audio quality is appalling. <laughs> when I reviewed the footage it was awful so I've had to order an adapter for an external microphone and an external microphone. But for the time being I'm going to use both cameras and we'll just switch backwards and forwards. There's a good look at that stock now and this is ready for the next operation which is to do the profile on the end of the spinner. Now I did have to do some extra work on this before I got to that point 
the threaded hole wasn't deep enough, even though I drilled a three quarters of an inch, but I didn't have, or thought I didn't have, a plug tap to run that thread all the way to the bottom of the hole. I checked, I did have one, but even when I ran that all the way to the bottom, it soared and tightened up on the hub of the propeller. Now part of the problem is that this propeller is a cheap one. I need to get one where the hub is at least the same diameter as the prop driver, or preferably bigger, and I believe it should be thicker as well. But for the moment, I can run this uh, stock down now onto the threaded section of the crankshaft. And you'll notice that there's a little bit of the plane section of the thread showing there. So I had to counterbore the back of the spinner a little bit more to get over that plane section. But that now tightens up. And the other thing I wanted to check before I went any further was to see if there was any run out in that blank there. Now, I don't know what I can do about it. In the, the next step, we're going to put this onto a spigot in the lathe, which has been single point threaded. And I haven't taken it out of the chuck, so it should be accurate. So when we profile the sound, get the semi-elliptical shape to it, it should at least be concentric to that spigot in the lathe. But whether it's going to be good when we put it back in the crankshaft, I don't know. The other thing it says to do in the notes here is to drill a cross hole through the end of the spinner, 187 thou, but it doesn't specify where. But I'm going to put it close to the tip so it doesn't intersect that threaded hole. And that's going to give you a, a, a way of actually putting a rod through the end of the spinner and tightening it down really hard onto the propeller. So we'll do that first and then we're going to try and get this nice uh, semi-elliptical shape. Now it didn't say in the notes what that profile is. I don't know whether it's parabolic or uh, semi-elliptical or just a sort of a freeform shape. But I'm going to make it semi-elliptical. This is the setup that I use for cross drilling and uh, also doing axial drilling in my metal lathe. And if you want to try and replicate this setup, try to get hold of an old two-speed corded drill with a metal gearbox. So this one's an AEG and the modern drills with polymer gearboxes just aren't rigid enough for doing this sort of work. Now this uh, fixture that it's clamped into is a homemade aluminium casting and it's got a split down the side here and a cap screw to clamp it down tight. Now this was lined board in my lathe while it was sitting in the compound slide. So that ensures that the bore of this fixture is concentric with the spindle of the lathe. So <clears throat> in this configuration here I can cross drill accurately and I can use my saddle of the lathe to position the drill bit relative to the work. So what I've done here is I've marked the depth of the drilled hole that will take the end of the crankshaft and I want to make sure that I cl uh, clear that drilled hole in the center of the stock here when I do the cross drill. So that's why I've marked that and I'll set this up now and we'll clamp the spindle and we'll go ahead and cross, cross drill all the way over with a 3 uh, drill bit. So what we're going to do now is sort of crank that up really tight against the face of the spigot and then do all of the profiling. Alright, what I've been able to do here is to mount this on the spigot and then use the drill bit to really tighten that down against the back face of the spigot. Now this is the gadget that I've been dying to use. I bought this a while ago and haven't actually used it for this operation yet. Now the basic system that you can see here, this table and the turning tool is part of Eccentric Engineering's Tornado freehand turning system. Now, I've showed the basic uh, operation of this in some of my other videos, but I recently purchased this tracer arm. And what it allows you to do is to fix a template on this arm at the back here and use the tool holder to trace around that template. Now, when you buy the uh, tracer attachment, you get a single brass piece of stock which you can cut into whatever profile template that you want but I was able to draw up this 
quadrant of a, an ellipse in my CAD program and then laser cut that from 3mm thick acrylic including the, the drill holes. So I've kept that as a template and in future I can sort of make up any template I want, any length uh, that will fit on the arm and uh, whatever profile you want. And this is the bit that we're going to shape. Now this is uh, a true elliptical shape or one quadrant of that and the distance from here to here is half of the major axis corresponding to the length of the stock here. Half the minor axis is the radius of this stock. So in theory we should be able to produce that exact same profile on this piece of aluminium. And this um, pantograph arrangement here keeps the tool bit in exactly the same relationship as the stylus that traces out against the template. So even though it's translated slightly to the right because of the angle that it's on, uh, it will still produce the same shape. And I can get the stylus right into that corner there uh, and I can cut out as far as that point there which is sort of where the end of the template is. That will be the full length of the stock. So I've never done this before. Um, I've, like I say, I bought this unit a while ago and haven't used it yet. I, had in mind that I'd buy it for this project. Anyway, I'm going to get this set up and then we'll have a look at how it works. Alright, it's probably a bit awkward to see, but when I take that tracer point right in against the corner of the template, the tool bit is up against the end of the stock here. Now you can actually offset the tool a bit. Um, in the early stages, you just want to rough it out. You can sort of keep the tool bit away from its final position and you can start roughing out the shape and then when you get close to wanting to trace the entire profile you can reposition the saddle of the lathe. So I'm going to just work at this corner here until we get some of that stock off and then we'll slowly move the cross slide in toward the center of the lathe and then we'll move it uh, axially until we sort of cleaned up this, uh, this nice point on the end of the spinner. Anyway, um, let's give it a go. Alright, well that was tracing the template uh, right at the end there. Initially it's going to take a while, there's going to be a lot of sort of cutting that we need to do here. There's a lot of stock to come off and uh, because we're just operating this tool by hand you can't put a lot of pressure on it. So I'm just going to work away at this, uh, I'll get it roughed out and we'll come back when we're getting close to being finished. Well, that took a lot longer than I thought. Um, the problem was where this cross hole uh, was drilled through, the tool was uh, chattering and bouncing over that hole there. But uh, toward the end, you just got to keep working backwards and forwards, taking very, very fine cuts. That tool tip was still cutting uh, on that last pass and in various places. And I imagine that there's, there's high spots and valleys and so on. And there is a finishing tool that you can fit uh, into this tool holder, which has got a, a much broader curve in it. 
not sure how that works with the tracing attachment but I think with this I'll just hit it with some memory cloth I'm pretty sure it's going to be fine geometrically I'm sure that's correct uh, finish wise it's going to take a bit of dressing but uh, if I hadn't done it that way I would have to use some sort of step turning geometry and I've done that before I've made uh, complex parts like this by doing a series of staircase steps and then blending it with a file but um, I think this little tornado tracing attachment has got some really good applications so I'll get this cleaned up and then we'll try it on the engine That looked pretty good until I got the wet and dry and started sanding axially and then you can see every tiny little uh, defect in that surface there and really the only way to polish a part like this is to first of all sand axially then radially right round and round the part and then keep alternating between axial sanding and radial sanding until there are no more scratches but you know like I said it looked pretty good <laughs> and now I can see these really deep grooves in here and uh, I want all them out but I'm not going to do this now, I'll do it off camera I'll have a look at it when it's done and uh, this is eventually going to be anodized so I do want it to be uh, not shiny but I want it to have an even texture and uh, those little grooves there are going to show up really badly if we don't get rid of them now well, I've given that a sort of a preliminary polish. Uh, it's almost certainly going to get scratched and knocked around by the end of the build. And just before I anodize this, I'll give it another polish up and make sure it's as good as I can get it. In fact, already I can see little scratches and marks just from putting it down on the bench. But I can show you that that prop driver goes on there. Prop goes on. Spinner goes on. tighten all that down so it's clamping the propeller against the driver and we got a very very small amount of clearance there I'm not sure exactly what clearance is meant to have but it feels pretty good so unfortunately I'm gonna to have to sort of wind this episode up here now now I know I said I was going to get to doing the cylinder head and do the fins and drill all the holes, get everything bolted together, but I had no idea these two parts were going to take so long. But you know what, I feel really bad about it. So what I thought I'd do is prepare a sort of a 3D animation CGI thing for you just to give you some sense of what it's going to look like when it's done. And there it is. What do you think of that? Oh, come on. I spent ages doing that. Well, if that's how you feel, I'm going to leave it here. Uh, thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next episode. And in that episode, we are going to do those parts. I guarantee it. Trust me, it's going to happen. All right, it's Prezo signing out for now. See you later.